Welcome back to The Heat. We're discussing China's investments in international ports as part of its One Belt, One Road initiative. Let's get back to our panel right now. Let's get to Ali Khan. Ali Khan, in Kenya, Mombasa just wasn't, doesn't want the port developed. It wants to become a special economic zone model on the Chinese cities of Shenzhen and Zhuhai. Uh, how important is China's One Belt, One Road initiative, that's its big global international development plan, uh, say, to the development of a port like Mombasa? It's absolutely key. If you look at the geography through the ocean and you think of yourself, you look at the Indian Ocean and it's, in my view, an appendage of the South China Sea, you're looking at a market of nearly three billion people and you, Mombasa surely has a role to play as a key port in addressing that market, whether it's out of Africa, whether it's into East Africa. And I think when you see it in that context, you see the importance of a, of a port like Mombasa. Of course, the Indian Ocean was a, a trading zone for many centuries and a very successful one. It was then due to the reversible escalator monsoon wind, which would bring the Dows all the way from Asia down to Maputo, and then the wind would turn around and take them back. And I think Mombasa is going to be a resurgence of the Indian Ocean economy. And I think that is inevitable. It's driven in part by Justin Lin, who was the once the World Bank chief economist, spoke about Arabi now to support low-cost manufacturing. I imagine Port the Mombasa port, becomes the conduit for the Indian Ocean and beyond. Now, Wang Lin, when you look at Kosman, there's an element of risk. Uh, for instance, there's been opposition to China's acquisitions in Piraeus, as we just heard a moment ago, in Greece. There's also been the suspension of uh, the Colombo port development in Sri Lanka. How does China manage risks of this kind? Yes. Uh, Ch actually, it's true that actually Chinese companies are the freshmen and the newcomers uh, in terms of the engagement of overseas investment or the investment of the global ports. There are many lessons that Chinese companies are learning. And from my observation, first, Chinese companies need to establish solid and reliable local partnership. Chinese companies could not develop a port in a foreign land alone. They need to establish a partnership, and their partner should help them to know the local market, know the local polit politics, and know the local demands. And second, actually, both the host country and also the Chinese company, either they are investor or over operator, they should establish a very pragmatic and feasible development model for the port. Uh, and there is also a demand or request for the host country that the host country should have a higher level of governance and also should have a very clear strategy about how to develop port and how to develop their country to be the hub in the region. And the third uh, is also very important and also mentioned to the cases that you have said. It is that Chinese companies should learn more about how to improve the local governance, how to interact with the local community, and how to improve their trans, uh, transparency, and also how to do better in CSR. George, the uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping, he visited Greece in July, and he talked about the development of the Port of Piraeus, and among the things that he said was that he wants to turn this port into the biggest transshipment port for containers in the Mediterranean, something of a bridgehead where Piraeus will serve as the entry point for goods going into and out of Europe. So how important is it for Greece to position itself as China's gateway into Europe? His presidency mainly referred to the critical geographical position of, of the Piraeus port, which is actually the entrance of uh, products and commodities entering uh, the European Union. And what is highly important to say is that the investment of China in the port of Piraeus is not a bilateral issue per se affecting the improvement of the bilateral relationship between Greece and China, but it also affects the Sino-European uh, partnership because uh, commodities can arrive to the port of Piraeus and from there they can be transported through Greece and through the Balkans into Central and Eastern Europe. China's 16 Plan 1 strategy could be part of this policy, while also the construction of a speedy high line, uh, speedy train service connecting Greece via the Balkans to Central and Eastern Europe can also play a critical role towards this direction. 
At the same time, also it is important to mention that Greece's stability is an important part for uh, the success of China's investment, because apart from some economic uh, problems during the crisis, Greece is the most stable country in its neighborhood, and this can be a guarantee for the success of Costco, starting with the transaction in the Piraeus port, and also developing into other areas, including trade and other investments in various sectors. Uh, China always says that the investment of Costco in the port of Piraeus uh, could be the most important part of its uh, investments and its uh, relationship with Greece. And from the moment this has started, we can be optimistic towards the future because more sectors can be developed thanks to this investment by the Chinese company. Mustafa, uh, Guadal Port is part of a $46 billion bilateral project between uh, China and Pakistan. Uh, and in fact, Pakistan has just approved the, um, Russia's request to use the port for the export of its goods. So I want to ask you a question, something that uh, Ali Khan alluded to at the beginning of the show, and that is, you know, how does this change the geopolitics of the region? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, going to impact, impact the geopolitics uh, in a big way because uh, there's a sort of a new, as I had earlier said, a pan-regionalism emerging in which there's a lot of interest from different countries, including Russia, including other countries, and uh, the mega financing that China has at its disposal is also altering the financial architecture, uh, which will subsequently affect the geopolitics. So the AIIB and the Silk Road Fund, which have been established in the past few years under President Xi Jinping's watch, have over $100 billion respectively each uh, at their uh, discretion. And uh, apart from that, the projects which are being invested in are very uh, important not only economically for the host country in China but also strategically because they are connecting a lot of other countries and making the economies of the area more interdependent to each other. So I think Russia's advent into uh, Gwadar port further strengthens the one belt one road policy and the project with Central Asia, with Europe and uh, with South Asia, of course. And uh, you can see that Pakistan has become a very relevant player because of this project in the region. And it has also strengthened the harmony uh, and peaceful cooperation in this area because uh, each country will have an economic stake in the other's uh, economic future which I think uh, will be very good for the whole area as it's an emerging market. And uh, the synergy which has been lying untapped for so many years and decades is finally being tapped. Ali Khan, one quick point about something you mentioned a moment ago, and that is the development of this railway uh, network, uh, which and Mombasa will be the starting point for this railway network. Um, what does it do for the hinterland? I mean, this is a rich hinterland that you're talking about, the countries of Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda. Uh, what, about, what does it do for regional development? So, so, first of all, China is financing and building all these railways, in, not only in Kenya, they're financing a railway in Tanzania. And all these railways are interconnecting. The idea eventually is about all of the East African community, then up to DR Congo, which is incredibly rich, Rwanda. So, so it is an enormous investment on the same scale of the railway investment more than a century ago, the famous Lunatic Express. So we've got a lot of money that's going into our ports. Um, we've got a lot of money going into our railways. And I think, you know, what China is doing is interconnecting all these African countries as well in a very interesting manner. And, a, and it's going to have a very strong political effect as well. So, yes, absolutely, the infrastructure spend could not have been done without China's help. It's China that's largely financed it. The World Bank and the IMF would have found these projects too big, given the country sizes, and wouldn't have taken the risk on. So it's the, what I call the plumbing, the, you know, the plumbing of the world. And for a lot of, in Africa, we're going to feel the benefit because we're leapfrogging. We're going from a situation when we, where we had very little to this new, much improved situation, ports more efficient, railways, the roads. But just to return to one point uh, uh, regarding Chinese investment, 
Uh, uh, like your uh, speaker in Beijing, I think, you know, what happened, China initially was very much a contractor hired to build our ports, hired to build our roads. And what you're seeing is the evolution of Chinese investment. It's moved from a contracting model to being an investor, to looking at value addition, and then thinking to itself, in order to make my investment bulletproof, we've got to affect trickle down and benefit for the community around us. And it's not just about purely about propaganda. We've really got to make it happen. So it's, it's a very interesting development. I think it's growing sophistication in the Chinese model and better, uh, uh, better tailoring to the geopolitical and political realities that Chinese investments are having to operate in, whether it's Piraeus, whether it's Mombasa, and anywhere else in the world. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arun Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.